Welcome back folks to another exciting JLAN Bio exclusive video today. We are focusing on AP Chemistry and we are going to do video 5-2, which focuses primarily on reaction mechanisms and catalysts. So if you remember from our last video, we talked a lot about rate laws, how to both experimentally determine those rate laws and to determine them based off of graphs, based off of data, all that good stuff. Well, today we're going to focus on reaction mechanisms and understanding that most reactions don't just take place in a single step. There are multiple steps to each chemical reaction that takes place. And that involves things that are called intermediates, which we'll dive into here in just a moment. Also, we're going to look at the presence of catalysts and how catalysts play a huge role in how the chemical reaction takes place. Uh, catalysts can lower the activation energy that's required for the reaction to take place, thus causing the reaction to go faster. Catalysts can orient molecules in a certain way, which makes the collisions more effective, and more effective collisions means a quicker chemical reaction. So let's go ahead and dive in. Hopefully by the end of this video, you will be able to explain multi-step reaction mechanisms, determine full equations from those reaction mechanisms, you should be able to evaluate reactions for the rate determining step and write the reaction rate for slow and fast first step mechanisms. You should also be able to explain how enzymes and catalysts impact reaction rates. So let's go ahead and get started talking a little bit about reaction mechanisms. Now, while balanced equations give us reactants and products for a reaction, it really doesn't tell us much about how this process happens. We just take a look at reactants and then get them getting converted into products, but there's quite a few other steps that are, are in between that take place that allow us to get a better understanding of how the reaction actually occurs. Reaction mechanism shows step-by-step step the transformation of reactants into products. So if we take a look below, the reaction itself is two nitrogen monoxide molecules reacting with bromine to form NOBr. Now you go through and you balance that and you get your equation here, but what you don't see is the intermediate that is formed. So the first step of the reaction is that the two NO molecules actually combine to form N2O2. This then reacts with bromine and produces NOBr. So notice that the product in the first step of the mechanism is in the reactant of the second step. Now, when we typically look at a full chemical reaction, we don't show the intermediates. We don't see those. The reason being is that they occur so quickly and are used up so quickly as well is that they, they really aren't uh, essential for the full chemical reaction. Okay? I mean, they are essential, but they aren't shown in the full reaction. We don't show intermediates because they don't last very long. So the intermediates formed in that first step and then reacts in the second step with the bromine to produce the actual product. When we look at step-by-step -step mechanisms, we cancel intermediates that are on the left and right-hand side. So those cancel out, thus we have NO, NO, and BR on the left side, and two NOBRs on the right side. Thus, the full equation, 2NO plus BR2 yields 2NOBR. Before we continue with this video, I want to talk about my sponsor today. My sponsor, Big K Diet Cola. I'm telling you, when it's early in the morning and I really need to get going for my AP chemistry, I reach for a Big K Diet Cola. Let's just do some chemistry ASMR for a second. Oh. <sighs> delicious. Let's, speaking of delicious, let's talk about reaction mechanisms. We call these specific names based on the number of molecules that are in the reactant part of the reaction. So unimolecular would be a single molecule that forms a product. Bimolecular is two molecules that form a product. And trimolecular is three molecules that form a product. Now these are for the elementary steps. Trimolecular is very, very rare for a single step mechanism because you have to have a lot of interesting kinetics actually go through and take place to get that to happen. Notice the rate laws as well. The rate laws are directly related to the coefficient that you would find in the balanced chemical equation. So take a look at the bimolecular, for example. A plus B yields the product, so that's first order for A and first order for B. But if I have two A's, then the reaction order for that particular reactant is two. Now keep in mind, with unimolecular, bimolecular, and trimolecular, the total order of the reaction is the individual orders added together. So unimolecular A is one, bimolecular, whether it's AB or A2, uh, the reaction order for that is 2. And then same with the ones down at the bottom, those all have a reaction order of 3. And you know how that plays a really important role in determining the rate of which the chemical reaction takes place. Let's take a look at multiple mechanisms. So many times multiple steps are required for a reaction to take place. We took a look at that previously. 
And notice in this reaction that NO3 is produced yet consumed in the next step. So this is known as the intermediate. That's what I was talking about with things that will go through and cancel in this chemical reaction. It's typically very unstable, the intermediate, and never really isolated in the reaction. So we don't include it in the full chemical equation. But it is important to show that in each individual step of the reaction if you're looking at the mechanisms that take place. I'm getting a little bit blurry, but still should be easy to read. It has been proposed that the conversion of ozone into O2 proceeds in a two-step mechanism. It wants us to describe the molecularity of each elementary reaction in this mechanism. It also wants us to write the overall reaction and identify any intermediates that are in the reaction. So let's take a look and see what we got here. So it first wants us to describe the molecularity of the elementary reaction. Well, this first one here, we have one reactant. So that's going to be unimolecular. And the second one here has two, so that's going to be bimolecular. Pretty easy. Again, we're looking at the reactants. We have one reactant here, we have two here. Okay. Next one says to write the equation for the overall reaction. Well, remember, we need to cross off any intermediates that exist in the products of one and the reactants of another. Just kind of like what we did with the net ionic equation. Very, very similar to that. So notice that we have oxygen and oxygen there. So that's our intermediate, so we're going to go ahead and get rid of that. So what we end up with is two O3s, and that ends up forming three O2s. And what's nice is that if you look at it, everything's already balanced. Two O3s, six oxygens, three O2s, that gives us six oxygens as well. And it asks us to identify the intermediate. Well, we crossed off the intermediate. The intermediate here is going to be oxygen, okay? Again, pretty straightforward there, but make sure that you can identify the intermediate and determine the molecularity of each individual step in a reaction mechanism. So most of the reactions we're going to take a look at will be elementary reactions. That is pretty basic and straightforward uh, steps for reaction mechanisms. In this case, the rate law is based directly on the stoichiometric ratio. So here, we talked a little bit about this earlier, A plus B yields your product. So the reaction rate is going to equal K, which is your reaction constant, multiplied by the concentrations of A times the concentration of B. If we have two A's that are converted into products, the rate is K times A squared. Remember, we talked about that with the rate law and the order is based directly on the stoichiometric ratios that are listed there. All right? So when we look at and try to determine the reaction rate, it's important to understand that the overall reaction rate for multi-step mechanisms are determined by each individual mechanism. Some steps will be slow and some, step, some steps will be fast. The step that determines this is the rate determining step, which is always the slowest step. This governs the rate law for the entire reaction. So think about it. It's just like uh, what they say with like the armed forces and things like that. You're only as strong as your weakest member. Well, your reaction is only as fast as your slowest step. Um, so just got to keep that in mind that the slow step of the reaction always, always, always determines the rate of the reaction. So there are two different ways to determine the reaction rate of a uh, reaction mechanism. And in order to do that, we need to determine which step is the slow step. Now, once we determine that, we can follow certain rules to determine the uh, rate law that governs the reaction mechanism. So the first thing we're going to look at here is that if the first step is slow. So if the first step is slow, then the rate of the entire reaction is based off of the reactants of the first step of the mechanism. So it's pretty straightforward. If the first step is slow, take the first reactants that exist in that first step and turn that into your rate law. Remember our reaction order, so we need to look at the stoichiometry. We need to look at the coefficients of the balanced equation, and that's going to help us to determine the total reaction order as well. So let's do a practice problem. The decomposition of nitrous oxide, N2O, is believed to occur by a two-step mechanism. N2O yields N2 plus O, and N2O plus O yields N2 plus O2. Write the chemical equation for the overall reaction and determine the rate law for the overall reaction. Well, the first thing we want to do is write our overall reaction. So in order to do this, we need to look and cancel any intermediates that we might have here. So if I take a look at the products of my first step, I have an oxygen, but I also have an oxygen as a reactant for my second step. So those are going to cancel. So what I end up with is 2N2O yields 2N2 plus O2. And there's my overall reaction for the entire thing. I just take what are in my reactants and my products and kind of add them up. 
Always check to make sure your equation is balanced and we're in good shape. The next thing says to write the rate law for the overall reaction. Well, in order to do that, remember, we need to determine which step is slow and which is fast. The very first step is slow. So all that's going to govern this reaction is the reactant. Okay, so the rate law for this rate equals K times the concentration of N2O. And since it's first order, because you look at the coefficients of the equation, um, it's one, okay? So we don't even really look at the fast reaction. Remember, the slow step is the one that determines the rate. So all we're looking at is what's in that very first reactant part. Since that's the slow step, that's what governs the reaction. Don't be fooled by the overall reaction, okay? Don't be fooled by this. Make sure you look at which is the slow step and follow the rules as they are discussed, all right? Let's move on to the next, uh, next thing. So slow step is pretty straightforward, but fast initial step gets a little bit trickier, so hear me out. In this instance, the second step is rate determining, and its rate is K equals the concentration of NO times the concentration of NOBr2. Now if we take a look here and think about this, and think about what we talked about earlier, NOBr2 is an intermediate that is very unstable and has a low unknown concentration. It reacts so quickly in that step that we really don't know what happens to it. Since NOBr2 is made so quickly from the original reactants in step one, we can consider them part of the slow reaction step. So what we're going to do is we're going to substitute the reactants from reaction one with NOBr2 because it occurs so quickly that basically NO and Br2 are part of step number two. So we simply substitute them in for NOBr2. So the new reaction rate is K equals the concentration of NO times the concentration of NO times the concentration of Br2. We substitute those parts of the fast reaction in for the slow. Or, as we get when we you know, get everything taken care of and balanced out here, K equals the concentration of NO squared um, times the concentration of Br. So again, when the first step is fast, we take the reactants of that first step and substitute them in for the intermediate part of the reaction, okay? So it's a little bit trickier here, but I mean, again, it kind of makes sense. They're made so quickly that it essentially is a part of the slow reaction mechanism. Let's do a practice problem just to double check to make sure we understand what's fully going on here. Show that the following reaction mechanism uh, produces a rate law consistent with the experimentally observed one. So what we need to do here is determine the rate law of this reaction, okay? So first thing we need to notice is that we have a fast first step and a slow second step. So this step is rate determining. So let's start off by just writing that out. So the rate is equal to K times concentration of N2O2 times concentration of Br squared. Okay, now remember what we talked about previously. This is an intermediate. It goes, reacts so quickly that we can assume that the reactants of step number one are a part of the reaction rate. So we're going to substitute these two guys in for that. Okay, again, this is only if you have a fast first step. So the real rate, K times NO times NO times Br squared. And then again, we're going to simplify that because we have two NOs, so the rate And there's your final rate, okay? So again, if it's a fast first step, we're gonna take the two reactants in step number one and substitute them in for the intermediate that is found in step number two, okay? Again, fairly straightforward, but a little more complex than if you have a slow first step. So let's wrap up by talking a little bit about catalysts. And before then, we need to really focus on activation energy. Activation energy is the amount of energy required to kickstart a chemical reaction. A reaction will not start unless it has a little bit of energy to kind of get things going. A catalyst is added to lower the activation energy required for the reaction to take place. And this is typically done by finding a mechanism that requires less energy or helps with the orientation of the molecules to increase the number of collisions. So if we take a look at the reaction diagram down below, we have our reactants and we have our products. Our reactants without the enzyme require an enormous amount of activation energy to start the chemical reaction. Notice in the blue line, though, that the activation energy is lower with the enzyme. And this can be because it found a new mechanism, um, it orients the molecules in a certain way. Regardless, it lowers the activation energy for the reaction to take place, which means that the reaction is going to take place faster. 
Catalysts many times will cause the reaction rate to increase hundreds, even thousands of times faster than without the catalyst. Now keep in mind that the amount of a catalyst will not change in a chemical reaction. It is not used up. So catalysts continue working regardless of the amount of reactant or product. Again, some bind to the reactant, which either orient the catalyst in a way where collisions are more ideal or react with less energy required. Some create a new intermediate through bonding, which is more energy efficient and thus requires less activation energy to take place. And some work as a surface catalyst. So if you look at the right hand side here, that hydrogen attaches to the catalyst and it actually helps break that apart. A lot of times metals can be used as a catalyst in chemical reactions. Ethylene then reacts with the hydrogen that's present on the catalyst itself, which forms two molecules of ethane, which forms a single molecule of ethane. So catalysts can work in a variety of different ways. It's just really important to make sure that you take a look and understand which catalyst is doing what particular thing. All right, guys, that kind of wraps up this unit. Pretty quick, pretty straightforward, but make sure you understand how to explain multi-step reaction mechanisms, determine full equations from those mechanisms, evaluate the reactions for rate-determining steps when it's slow or fast, and explain how enzymes and catalysts impact reaction rates. We're going to start with thermodynamics in our next unit. Really, really exciting. Looking forward to continuing with the second half of AP Chemistry. Appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for all that you do, and uh, we will talk to you later. Make sure you like, subscribe, leave a comment down below. Shop merch on the JLand Bio Store, and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye, guys.